So tonight we're going to be looking at three icons of evolution that are in the textbooks. That's the reason for the study tonight. <coughs> Uh, because these are still in our textbooks, in our, in our high school textbooks, as far as trying to show evidences of evolution. And that's the reason that we want to look at them. And some of this we've already looked at a little bit. And so it'll be a little bit of a, a, a rehash, but uh, I still think it's worthwhile to go in a little bit more detail. And the first one we're going to look about has to do with Darwin's finches, the so-called Darwin's finches. So you remember the story. You know, Darwin was on the Beagle. Uh, this expedition that was going to take several years to circumnavigate the entire globe. And along that way, they went, across, went to the Galapagos Islands. They spent some time there at the Galapagos Islands. Uh, that's, where, that's where Darwin started to formulate his theory on evolution. And as the story goes, he saw these various species of finches. Finches obviously are birds. Um, and there was differences in these finches depending on which island they were on. You know, there, and maybe even within the same island, some 13 different islands, excuse me, 13 different finches. And the story goes that, that Darwin saw those finches, saw the difference in their beaks, the difference in the size, and decided that through natural selection, those differences had occurred. So these species became separate, and uh, these birds became separate, these finches became separate, and developed into new species of finches based upon natural selection which has been given as a, as a proof that evolution occurs. Well, there's a couple of problems with that, and, and I've got a few pictures here. These are the different sizes of the finches, the, the, uh, the, the different sizes in their beaks, and, and how would natural selection cause these differences to occur? Well, it would depend on what the finches had to eat and their surroundings in the islands that they lived on, right? Now, that's how the story goes, at least. And so one beak might be more advantaged to eating a certain type of, of food on, on one island, and another beak might have an advantage on a, a food on a different island. Colors might have a different advantage on one island more so than the other. And so through, the, through this natural selection, you came up with these different species over these islands. Now, we've never said, at least I don't think I've ever said in this class, that natural selection doesn't work. Natural selection is not evolution, then there is natural selection. You know, the, the, the strongest animals will survive. The, the animals that have the most advantage will survive, and through genetics, their, their characteristics will be maintained over ones that don't. That's not really evolution, though. That's natural selection, and there's a difference. But to get from one different kind to another different kind is a total different story. But yet, this is what is used as proof of evolution, and I guess you could say uh, some of our biology friends, and especially evolutionists, would say that these are different transitional forms. But what most people don't know is that's really not how Darwin came up with his theory of evolution. Yeah, he observed the finches. That's true. But they had little to do with his formulation of his theory. They were only mentioned passingly in his uh, Beagle journal, and they're not mentioned at all in the book on, on the origin of species. They're not mentioned at all. But yet they're still heralded as uh, Darwin's mechanism or Darwin's idea on how evolution began. So that's why this is included in, in Jonathan Wells' book, Icons of Evolution, to shoot down the idea that that's not really what Darwin did. Now, some people coming along after him postulated that that's what he, how he probably came up with this theory, but that's not, what, that's not what Darwin said. So the idea is some of the finches, these finches that began supposedly as one different, one specific species, developed into 13 different species. But what's interesting now is these species are becoming, so they're, from hybridization, they're becoming less, not more, which is, I guess, anti-evolution. It goes against evolution if that's what you think evolution is. So why are Darwin's finches given so much preeminence? Well, the, Gop, the, the Galapagos finches were not elevated into their iconic status until the rise of neo-Darwinism, which was in the 1930s. We all know what neo-Darwinism is by now, right, in this class? If not, I haven't done a very good job. Uh, but that's the, the idea that changes occur, evolutionary changes occur, 
uh, through mutations. And when neo-Darwinism came along, then his, these finches of the Galapagos Islands became important. They were first called Darwin's finches by Percy Lowe in 1936. When was, Dar when was the origin of the species uh, published? 1859, so that's a long time after. And these finches were given evolutionary, excuse me, and it was popularized in 1947 by David Lack. These finches were given evolution, evolutionary significance, perpetuating the myth that Darwin's theory was based on this fact, and it was not. Frank Soloway says, or Soloway says, nothing could be further from the truth. That's not how Darwin postulated his theory based upon these finches. So, but is there evidence that evolution, that's ev that evolution is going on within these birds? Is there? Is evolution going on with these birds? No. Adaptation's going on. And even if you hold to that, that, that the idea that their beaks changed and their colors changed and their size changed based upon which island they were on, which may or may not be true, but even if that is true, that's not evolution. That's what we've kind of tried to drive home in this class. That's not a change in kind. So I would say the answer is an emphatic no. It's not evolution. It's an adaptation. Natural selection could explain some varieties of these finches, but they're not different kinds. And so that gets into the, the idea of what constitutes a kind. What, you know, we, and we've talked about this before. Uh, when you're talking about a kind, we're not talking about species. Not as man defines species. Because 13 different species of finches, and some of them don't breed together very well, okay? So you can't use whether or not uh, animals can breed together to, 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 to decide whether or not they're different species or not. But would anyone deny that any one of these 13 species of, of, of finches are birds? They're all birds. So they're in the kind that I would place as the bird kind. They're not different kinds. And this is especially when you see uh, the reversal of the shape and size of the beaks that these finches have occurred when weather circumstances change in, is in isolated islands uh, there. And this has occurred very rapidly. This change can occur in the size of these birds and the different sizes of their beaks in basically one year. These changes can occur. There was a, uh, uh, Wells talks about in the Galapagos Islands, there was a big drought that had gone on for quite some time, several years. And then El Nino came in and El Nino caused a lot of rain to occur. Well, just that one season where rains occurred, these birds, these, these finches started changing very rapidly. So natural selection can be a very rapid thing. Evolution is supposed to take what? Years, millions of years. So no, we're not dealing with, we're not dealing with evolution when we're talking about the birds. Yet despite uh, the finches of the, uh, uh, the Galapagos Islands, we're talking about one more time adaptation. And yet that's one of your proofs of evolution. That's what you're gonna see in the textbooks. And we talked, I talked about this, but this long drought that was in the 70s, followed by the heavy rains of El, El, uh, of El Nino. And what Je Joseph uh, Weiner put it, the way he put it was selection had flipped. <laughs> the birds took a giant step backwards, and there's less species of, of the finches now than there used to be. Evolution is supposed to produce what? More species, not less, but it took a giant step backwards. And yet, despite all this, and this is supported by hybridization. What's hybridization? Anybody remember what that is? Well, when you have two species breed together and they produce a hybrid, what's a, what's a common hybrid you can think of that we know of? Mule. Mule. That's one that comes to my mind right off. That's a donkey and a horse. Most of the time, the hybrids are, are infertile. Not always, but they are. And the hybridization occurs within these finches. They can breed together. Their offspring may not be able to breed, but they can breed together. And, he, and again, Joseph Weiner says this allows for fusion into the population. Once again, in my opinion, confirming the concept of kind. Would you place a dog, um, excuse me, would you place a, a horse and a donkey in the same kind? I would. Okay, right, equine, you could use that term, equine. But 
they're the same kind. So just because they can breed together and produce a hybrid that doesn't breed does not mean they're different kinds. And we see that. And once again, despite all this, the National Academy of Sciences still refers to Darwin's finches as a particularly compelling example of evolution. Just don't be fooled by that. That's the point. And I know you knew all this before tonight, but I want, I want to tidy up what's, what, we've, what we've studied in, in Jonathan Wells' book, Icons of Evolution. What's the second one we're going to study tonight? The famous peppered moths. Has anybody not heard of the peppered moths? The peppered moths of England, okay? They're a species of moth, moths. It can be quite a bit difference in their color, just as that slide represents there. You've got a melanic form on my bottom right. I think that's your bottom right as well. That would be melanic as the idea of dark. The melanin is the dark pigment that causes our skin to be darker in, in, in some people. <laughs> the more melanin you have, the darker your skin. And the non-melanic melanic or less would be the lighter color. So there's a very big difference in the color of these species. And as I said in the, in the little paper, almost every textbook in, in America still alludes to the peppered moths as a classical demonstration of natural selection and hence the mechanism for evolution. But what are the facts about peppered moths and do they offer any evidence for evolution? Because that's what they're still used for. Pepper moss, known as Biston betularia, can't pronounce that, betularia, has various shades of gray, you know, from very dark to very light. And what's the story? Why would one have an advantage on the other? Well, that's peppered moss on a tree trunk. Now, if you're a bird trying to eat a peppered moth, which one are you going to see more easily? The lighter one or the darker one? On this particular tree trunk, by the way. This is a dark tree trunk. If it was a light tree trunk, you would probably eat the, lighter, uh, the darker one first. But you can hardly see that moth that's there on that tree trunk, can't you? So for many years, the typical peppered moth was the light gray, the one on the right. And after a passage of time in, in the industrialized portions of England, the darker moth became the more popular or the more populated one. It survived more. And the theory goes is what happened with industrialization. The trees became darker. They were polluted. So they would become darker. And that actually did happen in, in parts of, of southern England where they became industrialized. So in 1996, J.W. Tut A biologist theorized that this change could be a result of the industrialization that occurred in Birmingham, England. A guy by the name of Bernard Kettlewell, who was a doctor, decided he would test that theory. And so what he did was he released moss on the trunks of trees, he put them on the trunks of these populated trees near Birmingham, and he included both the light ones and the dark ones. Moss included the lighter and the more typical form that was of that time, as well. Or, or, as well as the dark melanic ones. And once released, he set up traps to recapture the moth. Now, if you were, <laughs> if you were uh, a pharmaceutical company trying to set up an experiment to prove whether a drug worked or not, this, theory, this, this is a very, very poor <laughs> laboratory uh, experiment. It's got so many holes in it, it's not funny, okay, first of all. And your paper, if you presented it to be published, would be rejected just based on the fact that this study is not very scientific. But this is what he did. So he, he put those moths out there and, and waited overnight, or I don't know if it was one night or a couple nights, but then he tried to recapture them. And this is what he found. He, didn't, he had more melanics than he did typicals because there was more melanics, I guess, to find than there were the typicals. But what he did was he recaptured them. And the theory was, well, he, he was able to recapture 123 of the 477 but of the typicals, he was only able to capture of 137.18, excuse me. He recaptured 123 of the melodics, but out of the 137 typicals, he, ca he captured only 18, which percentage-wise meant that there was a 14% difference. There was more of the melanics around. So he theorized from that that by natural selection, birds were able to find the lighter colored ones easier and, and eat them, so there would be less around. 
And that, from a logical standpoint, stands to reason, does it not? And nothing wrong with that. It's just there's a lot of variables there, aren't there? I mean, he had to recapture them. Who knows if he recaptured, maybe the lighter ones flew off more. I mean, I don't know, but there's so many holes in the theory. But that was, that was, uh, that's what, what Kettlewell did. <clears throat> and he postulated that birds acted as selective agents by evolutionary theory. Now, he didn't do this just once. He went ahead and redid it again. He went to other parts of England to reproduce his study, and he found basically the same kind of thing. And the much larger, or not a much larger, but a larger percentage of the melonic survived than the, than the, than the, uh, the lighter gray color. And he called this the most striking evolutionary change ever witnessed in any organism. That's what this was called. It's funny how these, uh, these things occur, by the way. You know, you look at the finches, you look at the moss, you look at Archaeopteryx, and every time these studies are done or these, these, uh, these findings are, are, are found, it is like this is the best or the most, this is the best example we've ever seen yet. So we're going to see that especially when you look at human fossils. Because every time they find a new human fossil or humided fossil, it's the oldest one and the clearest one that shows evolution has occurred than anyone they found yet. I find that interesting, don't you, that that's the case. Well, it's the same kind of thing here. You get all these accolades that occur. Uh, and so you saw that with the finches. You see this with, with Kettlewell's experience. And so it's now, quote, the most striking evolutionary change ever witnessed. In 1975, P.M. Shepard called Kettlewell's observation, observation <clears throat> the most spectacular evolutionary change ever witnessed and recorded by man, with the possible exception of some examples of pesticide. So that's why you still find this in your books. And when you find it in your books, when you find it in the book that I've alluded to on several occasions here, which is Miller and Levine's, which is the Texas book that's used for uh, high school biology, you see this picture of these moths. But there's a little bit of a problem. First of all, if these dark or melodic moths had such a great advantage, they should almost have completely taken the place of the white ones, and that wasn't true, or the whiter ones. They should have just about completely replaced them if they had that big an advantage. And you saw that picture of the tree trunk. Seemed to be a pretty big advantage, didn't it? You could hardly see that black moth. So that's one, one problem. But there was also discrepancies in data. Other people <clears throat> did some work with, with the moss and looked, and looked at other areas of England, and in some areas where they didn't have industrialization, where there was lighter tree trunk still, guess what? The melanic still dominated, which didn't make any sense, right? If you had the lighter tree trunks, you should have the lighter variety perpetuating more than the darker, and that wasn't true. So there were some discrepancies uh, there were some discrepancies that. So we, we mentioned that here in rural whales, away from the pollution. What did the biologists say caused, uh, uh, caused this discrepancy? Well, they always fall back on something. They said, well, maybe there's some non-visual factors for selection going on here now. So you, you can't have it both ways. Uh, but that, that's what they would evoke. They would evoke the non-visual the, the non selective fi factors. What Jonathan Wells concluded was that Ketwell and other scientists had made a serious error, and that is they failed to look at the natural resting place of the moss. And it turns out it's not the trunk of the trees. Where these moss naturally rest is underneath the limbs of the trees, not on the trunk. They wouldn't be obvious. So why do we see pictures like that? You got a guess? If you read my, read my little paper, you, you know the answer. And that's because they were staged. The biologists want you to see that great difference. And so these pictures that you see in the textbooks are staged. And I, I reiterate this here in, in, on the slide that moths rarely fly during the day. They usually remain where they are on the tree. So if they were on the tree trunk, they would be in trouble. If on the trunk, the melanic moth would have more of an advantage from a natural selection point of view. But pictures of moths on the tree trunks are staged. They are glued to the trunk or they are pinned to the trunk. And so when you see those pictures, you need to understand that those pictures are not real. They are staged. The moths don't live there. Now, I'm not saying that camouflage wouldn't be an advantage to the moth. 
I've already said that natural selection, I have no problem with natural selection. What I have a problem with is having to stage something like that, okay? So you ask people, now, again, I, I hate to pick on Miller and Levine, but I'm sure it's true of most high school textbooks. It just happens to be this is the one that I have. And you look at Miller and Levine's, these fake photographs are still shown uh, with Ketwell's work, and they are called a classic demonstration of natural selection. Now, I don't know about Miller and Levine. They may just be ignorant. I don't know particularly them per se. They may be ignorant. They may not realize that these pictures are staged. But many of the people that put these in their textbooks know that they're staged, but they unapologetically put them in the textbooks anyway. And what is their answer for putting those pictures in the textbooks? They don't want to confuse the students. They would, that would, you know, we want to make it real simple. We want to make it where they can understand how natural selection really works. So they're going to put these pictures there to not, what does it say? That they, don't want to, they want to make it too convoluted for their young audiences. And I just think that that just shows again what evolutionists will go to to try to continue to perpetuate the myth. The peppered moss of England, they offer no support for molecules to man evolution, even if natural selection does favor a particular morphologic difference within kinds. You don't change kinds in any regard, do you? Whether the moth is dark or whether the moth is light or in between, you still got a moth. And so it's still not a mechanism for evolution that they're proving here. All right. Does anyone remember Archaeopteryx? Okay. Archaeopteryx, now he's really the, one of the major icons of evolution, he or she or it. And uh, uh, it, <laughs> again, it has been called, first of all, first of all, what is Archaeopteryx? Archaeopteryx was referred to as one of the purest examples of a true missing link that we have in, in biology because Archaeopteryx was a bird-like creature. He had a beak, but inside the beak were teeth, not like you would find in a typical bird. Uh, he had wings and he had feathers, so obviously he must have flown. And so this was supposed to be the missing link between what's the theory, where do birds come from? Dinosaurs. So that's, that's still the prevailing theory, by the way, is that, that birds are really ancient dinosaurs and that, that birds derive from dinosaurs. So this was supposed to be the missing link that showed that to be true. First of all, let me say something about missing links, and we've said this before as well. Missing links, there should be millions of miss, missing links between every species, not just birds and dinosaurs or reptiles and, and birds, if you will, but there should be missing links all over the place, millions. So when you talk about looking for the missing, I remember growing up, they're looking for the missing link, everybody looking for the, and that was, they're usually alluding to the missing link between man and, and chimpanzees or, or apes. But uh, there should be many, many, many missing links and there just are not. But this is one of the classic ones. And as you can gather, it's still, still in your, your textbooks as the missing link between reptiles and birds or dinosaurs. In 19, excuse me, 1861, German scientist von, uh, Hermann von Meyer found a fossil with wings and feathers, but also teeth and a long lizard-like tail that has come to be called Archaeopteryx. And that's one of the, that's probably the classic fossil finding of Archaeopteryx. I believe this is the, the, the one that's in uh, Berlin. By the way, most of the time when you see, uh, you go to the museum and you see a skeletal remains of a dinosaur or a human being, do you think you're actually seeing the skeletal remains of a dinosaur or a human being? What are you seeing? Plaster. Seeing plaster case. We'll, we'll talk about that when we get to human, evolu uh, human evolution as well. But this is, this is real. The, the, the animal existed. Nobody is going to deny, deny that. Now, I remember when I was in high school and we were talking about Archaeopteryx, there was debate on whether Archaeopteryx really had feathers or not. It's pretty well confirmed that the animal probably had feathers. So there's no real debate on that amongst, amongst uh, even creationists at this point. 
Uh, and again, this I think is in the Berlin uh, uh, Museum. And guess what? It's been called the most important natural history specimen in existence. You can hear that um, uh, more times. But is Archaeopteryx the almost perfect link between reptiles and birds as Harvard neo-Darwinist Ernest Meyer has proposed? We've heard of Ernest Meyer before too. Most paleontologists now actually disagree. 20 or 30 years ago, they may have agreed with that, but now they disagree. Larry Martin has says Archaeopteryx is not ancestral to any group of modern birds because of too many structural differences between the two. Here's the deal. Even if Archaeopteryx was the first bird, you realize how many steps it would take to get from the scale of a reptile to a feather? A feather is a very detailed structure. It wouldn't just suddenly go from scales to a feather. You know what I'm saying? It just can't do that. And yet, that's supposed to, well, the feathers just automatically appeared on this one animal. You would have to have so many transitional forms, if you believe that, where you're getting scales that become feathers, which are completely different structures. So just showing an animal that has feathers that sort of looks like a reptile makes, that, that's, that's not evolution. It's a funny looking animal. That's what it is. So controversy exists between evolution as, as to how flight evolved. How did, how did animals begin to fly? There is the tree down theory and there is the ground up theory. So you can probably figure out what this means. A tree down means that uh, animals were jumping from tree to tree to tree to tree. In fact, finally had to figure out or figured out it was easier to fly from one tree to the other to jump, than to jump. And so they sprouted wings and started flying. The ground up theory is, well, the reptiles were running for their food. They were trying to catch their food. It would be much easier if they eventually ran so fast and sprouted rings that they could fly to catch their food. So evolutionists don't know which one it is, but they know it had to be one of the two because they don't have any other theory. So this would imply a very different ancestor for Archaeopteryx. Prevailing theory is that Archaeopteryx devolved from two-legged dinosaurs. So which one would he be? He would have to be the ground up, right? He's running to catch his food. So they're looking for they're looking for predecessors to Archaeopteryx. They got to see, you know, there ought to be some transitional forms there, right? So ironically with this new view, paleontologists were forced to conclude that the most likely candidates for precursors for Archaeopteryx lived 10 million, 10 millions of years later than Archaeopteryx. Does anybody have a problem with that? You're going in the wrong direction. Okay. This necessitates a rearrangement of the file. Here's the other thing you're going to see when we study the human, rev human evolution as well. See, the data is what, is what matters, right? The data is what matters. So if the data don't fit, I've got to rearrange the data because I already believe evolution is true. So if I find a precursor to Archaeopteryx that was 10 million years later, I got a problem. And so that's what you have. Uh, 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 animal can't be older than its ancestor. I don't see how that works, do you? Jonathan Wells states that as a consequence, Archaeopteryx must be removed as the first bird and become another feathered dinosaur. Again, I'm not debating whether it had feathers or not. Uh, that debate has been done before by creationists. I'm not gonna make that debate. I don't care if it had feathers or not, but it appeared to have feathers. Now, so this creates a problem then. If Archaeopteryx isn't the first bird, what are paleontologists and paleoanthropologists trying to do? Well, they're trying to find the first bird. Unfortunately, as a result of that, paleontologists have become victims of fraud on numerous, and numerous occasions. I'm going to list three tonight. 1999, National Geographic featured Arche Archaeoraptor, a supposed flying feathered reptile. That's a kind of neat picture of that. This was, this was in National Geographic's, you know, magazine that everybody gets and you read and you figure everything in National Geographic's got to be true. Chinese paleontologist Zhu Xing said that Archaeopter, he discovered that Archaeopter was a dinosaur tail glued to the body of a primitive bird. It was a fraud, but for several years it got perpetuated. Total fraud. Then we had Bamaraptor a chicken-sized dinosaur, supposedly 70 million years younger than Archaeopteryx, and called, guess what, 
the most bird-like dinosaur yet discovered. And at least from a time standpoint, this one would make sense because he actually is younger and not older. There was a problem here too is. And this one, you do have a problem with feathers. Nothing remotely resembling feathers was found with this fossil, though these have been fabricated by ardent evolutionists. So when you see feathers on there, basically they have been painted on. They didn't find any feathers with this animal. And that I do have a problem with. There's no evidence that it had feathers. And here's one I thought was, a, was, and I don't know if you got the gist of this when you, when you read my paper, because I may not have made it quite as clear, but I'll try to make it a little clearer tonight. William uh, Gartska, I guess is how you pronounce his name, from the University of Alabama, along with his team, they found the DNA of a bird that was 65 million years old. The DNA of a bird. That's pretty impressive. 65 million years old. It became the first direct genetic evidence to indicate that birds represent the closest living relatives to dinosaurs. This was published and it was talked about at seminars and symposiums. Jonathan Wells went to one of those symposiums. Again, there's a problem. The DNA found was around and near Triceratops, which was the only animal it was found around. You know what Triceratops is? It ain't a bird. It's the, if you've seen pictures of it, it's got the three horns. Okay, that's the Triceratops, Tri. And here's the other startling news. The DNA found was exactly the same as a modern turkey. Why would that not cause a problem for these people? So it probably happened. We know what probably happened. Somebody was eating a turkey sandwich around there. I mean, seriously. That's probably what happened. Somebody was eating a turkey sandwich around this finding, and they found the DNA of a turkey sandwich. And it's not 99.9% .9 turkey. The DNA was 100% turkey. So did they, find, did they really think they found a, a 65 million year old turkey? And so, as you can imagine, the incident convinced me, that's Jonathan Wells, this is his quote from his book, that some people are so eager to believe that birds evolved from dinosaurs that they are willing to accept almost any evidence that appears to support their view. And ain't that the truth? And that's the problem we see in paleontology. Cladist. Cladist is a group of people that classifies people. I don't want to get into detail what cladists are, but cladists have dethroned Archaeopteryx as the missing link. They said it just doesn't fit, doesn't have enough clad. And I don't believe everything the cladists believe. I'm just saying that even paleontologists don't believe Archaeopteryx is a missing link anymore. But guess what? We already knew that. <laughs> you and I already knew that. We didn't need them to tell us that. And guess what? No one doubts unique features. Whether you think it should be considered a flying dinosaur or unique bird, there's no evidence to think of it as a missing link. But unfortunately, as you have guessed, Archaeopteryx is still featured as a classic example of the missing link in textbooks, even though paleontologists now agree to the contrary. The scientists don't even agree with it. But get your textbook out. You want, to let me, want, want me to show you Miller and Levine's textbook, and it's still there. Any questions? So I thought it was interesting. Yes, sir. So you know, several times referred to news and years and, and almost as though it's fact, and we haven't really covered, I assume, some point in the class we'll get into some of the... Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Do I accept that? No. But remember when I first started teaching this class, I said we were going to assume that the years are real, okay? Not because we believe it, but because we can, we can show that evolution is not true no matter how many years you think the universe is or how many years the earth is. And so that, that's what I want to make. Yeah, good. I want to clarify that. So you will see me next week when we get into human evolution. You're going to hear me talk about millions of years. Okay? Now, not that I accept that. And yes, we will deal with that. We will deal with that more in the second half of our class when we get into creation and we look at young earth, old earth, and the, and the evidence for quote-unquote both, if you will, 
But no, no. When I say millions of years, I'm using their data. And I don't know if Jonathan Wells believes that or not. A, a lot of the, especially the intelligent design people, they're old earth people. They believe that the earth is millions of years, but they don't believe that evolution was the cause of, uh, uh, of creation or of ca the cause of the organisms. But no, no, yeah, absolutely. Any other questions? Yeah, I, I hope I didn't, uh, y'all didn't think I've been saying this all this time because I thought it made, it made it real clear that we were doing this because we don't need a young earth to disprove evolution. You don't need it. I mean, you, don't have, you, know, you can believe it or not believe it, I guess, but you don't need, evolution doesn't, there's no facts for it whether you have 10,000 years or 13.7 billion years, which is supposed to be the age of our universe, 13.7, which in, in the earth is supposed to be what, 4.5 billion years? Something like that? Anyway, no, we don't need it. Any other questions? All right, so next week we'll start kind of a different subject. We'll be doing that for several weeks, and then we'll do one of my favorites, and that is uh, uh, entropy.